do enough good that God would accept us. Of course, we know there's none righteous, no, not one. We know for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but of course, the Galatian believers did not have the full revelation as you and I have. And so what they were going on is what they were being taught, what they were being told. Of course, the Apostle Paul had gone to Galatia, the region of Galatia, for weeks and preached the gospel, and folks responded to the gospel message that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes unto the Father but by Him. However, following His arrival were then some false teachers that crept in. And Paul is now writing to these churches who have bought in to the false teaching. And so Paul is going to do something that, in essence, really is something that perhaps all of us should do. And that is go back to the Scriptures. So Paul is going to take them all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. So here in Galatians chapter 3, Paul is going to refer to what happened all the way back in Genesis 12. We'll read that later on. But let's look here to Galatians chapter 3. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? We'll read Galatians chapter 3 beginning at verse number 6. Remember, Paul is still answering the question. He's, in essence, giving proof to, to the fact that justification comes by faith and not by the works of the law. Verse 6, Paul writes, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of, are, as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of, of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the testimony that Paul is using, actually, the word of God to answer the questions. Father, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to have a steady understanding and a ready appetite for the Word of God. God, that our questions would be answered by your Word, not by our thoughts or our opinions. So, Father, I pray that as we look at this Old Testament truth that carries eternal benefits, God, I pray that you'd help us to grow and help us to learn. 
what it means to receive the blessing of Abraham. So Father, bless your word. Our hearts teach us, instruct us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Remember, Paul is <coughs> dealing with the important matter that the Galatians were struggling with, and that is justification is by faith. Now, this is something that goes all the way back to chapter 1. I mean, Paul is just pounding this. He's pounding this into the Galatian believers as, as to mean just hearing it once isn't enough. And I realize that you know, that there's an element of me that I, I, I'm reading this, I'm studying this, I'm preparing messages about this, and I'm coming to a place and I'm thinking, wow, I mean, Paul, I mean, you, you, just, you just said this in our last study. And Paul, you, you said this three studies ago. And, and, and why would he do that? Obviously, repetition is what? Important. It's emphasizing something that is absolutely essential. And Paul is building all of this to then speak about how this affects our everyday life. You see, somehow, some way, we somehow have divorced theological truth with everyday life. And we think, you know, Theological truth, that, that's for the sermons, or that's for the theologians, that's for the seminaries. That, that's not what I need every day of my life. And the answer is, of course it is. Why? Because it is based upon the truth that we then live or flesh out. In essence, we would say it this way. Our belief dictates our behavior. What you believe should be seen by how you behave. That's why when the world, when the unsaved, the unregenerate crowd, looks at a group of Christians that have absolutely no biblical stance in what they are doing, they mock it. They look at it and they say... What, if, if you don't stand for anything, then what are you standing for at all? There's nothing there. And so Paul is writing to them, and he's, he's pounding this into them. Justification is not by the works of the law or the works of the flesh. It is by faith in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. So what does Paul do? He illustrates it. He gives us an illustration that every single Jewish person would understand. And that is Abraham. Abraham. Oh, this great patriarch of Judaism. They knew him. They knew him well. And so Paul says, let me show you Abraham. Who he is. What he has done. And so as we look at this passage, we of course have to hear again what God told Abraham. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. As you're turning there, I want you to think about this. Have you ever been blessed because of somebody else. That is, you, you got in on, on their blessing. One of the things I like to teach our children, and I like to demonstrate to our children, and that is when, when people bless us as a family. I mean, there, there's so many blessings that, that you guys bestow on us, and, and we're so privileged, and we're so blessed. We, we really are, and and it might just be some, you know, it, it might be a gift card. It might be um, just a, 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 a 
financial gift that says, hey, go out on a date, do this, do whatever. And it might be a, an encur a word of encouragement. It might be a note of encouragement. It might be some different things and different things. And I remember years ago when I was a kid, uh, my uncle played for the Cincinnati Reds. He was a, a pitcher uh, for what was known as the Big Red Machine. And matter of fact, he was just inducted into the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame this, this summer. And, uh, and you know, I, I lived in South Florida. We didn't have uh, a baseball team. The, the Florida Marlins were not even there. Now it's the Miami Marlins. Um, actually, they were there. They were just a minor league team. But anyway, my, my uncle would, would come into town for spring training or whatever, and, and uh, he would get us tickets, and we'd be able to go and, and uh, watch the game, and we would even be able to meet some of the players. So I've had the privilege of meeting guys like Johnny Bench and Pete Rose and they, uh, men like that. And, well, how? Well, because Uncle Fred. That's how. And there's been so many things in, in life that happens because you know somebody. And, and the old adage, it's not what you know, it's who you know. All right, that you can get blessed. And, and there's truth to that. And, and what we're going to see here is that it's, it's knowing Abraham and knowing what Abraham did. You and I can get in on the blessing. Because God made a very clear, distinct blessing. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12. Again in verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And make your name great. And guess what? You shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now we of course have people who take this as a national narrative, meaning this. As long as you stand with Israel, God is going to bless you. Now I think that there's ramifications of that. God is speaking directly to Abraham. And God is saying to Abraham, listen, Abraham, I am going to make you a father of many nations or a great people. And all those who attach themselves like you are to me, I will bless. That is exactly what Paul is telling the Galatians. So let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. How does Paul do this? Paul is using this Old Testament illustration, this Old Testament patriarch that every single Jew knew about. And so Paul begins in verse number 6. Even as Abraham. He tells you, he tells me, as he told them, that when we, like Abraham, do what Abraham did, we become the recipients of God's blessings. Verse 16 says, now to Abraham and his seed for the promises made. You and I can get in on this. The blessing of Abraham. So let's, let's ask ourselves, or maybe answer the question, what are the blessings of Abraham? Well, first of all, notice in verses 6 through 9, we see the children that he speaks of. The children of Abraham. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye not, or know ye therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Remember, seeing the 
the song in Sunday school and children's church, what? Mother Abraham had many sons. Right? Don't, don't, don't do it, because I don't want to get into the motions and everything. And I'm all uncoordinated, so it would not go well. But but anyway, you right, you remember that. Father Abraham had many sons, and what? We are the sons and daughters of Father Abraham only by one way. Not because we became his descendants from physical human birth, but by what? Spiritual birth. Remember, Paul is dealing with justification is by faith. And so look at verse number 6. Even as Abraham obeyed God, and it was counted or accounted to him for righteousness, right? Isn't that what the scriptures say? You know, because here's what God said to Abraham. God said back in Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham, or Abram, was still in what was known as Ur of the Chaldees, Mesopotamia, God said to him, hey listen Abram, I want you to leave this place and I want you to go to another place. A place that I will show you. Question, did Abram obey God? And the answer was, of course he did. Absolutely he did. Matter of fact, he kept going, and as he arrived into this land that he thought God was leading him to, what? He continued on south and went all the way down into Egypt. Why? Because in that land that he was being led to was what? In a famine. But what did Abram do? He obeyed God. But why did he obey God? You see what Paul is doing? He's masterful. Paul is saying, wait, you know, here's what happens. We like to think that Abraham was counted righteous with God because what? He obeyed God. But let me tell you, that is not why God counted him righteous. Why did God count him righteous? Verse 6 again says, even as Abraham believed God. That word believe is the same word that God says to you and to me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's absolutely nothing in Scripture from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 22 that ever tells us that in order to be saved, you have to obey God. Now, question, should we obey God? <laughs> of course we should. The problem is that we equate salvation or justification, deliverance from hell, whatever term we want to use to be what? Or to be brought about by obedience. And again, we, we, we do that in our churches today. Sometimes we've got to catch ourselves. Hey, you know what? Hey, if you come to church on a regular basis, if you get to the church... And you make sure that you tithe that amount. <coughs> give, give the full tenth. As long as you do this, and as long as you, you serve in this capacity of ministry. And you know what? You go through the baptismal waters. You partake of communion with us. You will be made righteous with God. And God says, eh, wrong answer. It is by what? By faith. Now, should we do any of those things? Should we do all of those things? The answer is, of course we should. But that's not a matter of justification. And so Paul says in verse number 6, as he closes his out, he says that it was accounted to him for righteousness. Why? Because the only way that you and I, as sinners, in the sight of God, can be made righteous is not through anything that you and I can do. Why? Because every single good deed that we do as an unrighteous sinner is still unrighteous. And it's only through Jesus Christ that 
we can be made righteous. And so Paul makes this so clear to them. And so he says in verse number 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So Abraham was thus constituted the father of all believers. And it is his justification that is the pattern for every single person. You say, how were people saved in the Old Testament? The exact same way that you and I are saved. By faith. By faith. They look forward to one who would eventually die on a cross. Though they didn't understand any of it. You and I have the privilege of looking backwards. To the one that hung on a cross for our sin. And so, God, Paul continues on. And he says in verse number 8, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen. <laughs> How many of you would say, that's me? Or at least used to be. Right? Yeah, that, that, that's my description. That's my title. The heathen. The sinner. The wicked. The rebellious, yep, that, that's me. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, did what? He preached before the gospel of Abraham. He, what? Abraham had the gospel preached to him? That's what Paul just said. The gospel isn't just a New Testament terminology. The gospel goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in verse number 15 when God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. Yeah. There was this justification how man could be justified with God. Again, we might use that simple terminology just as if I've never sinned. I've become the righteousness of God. And so Paul says, they, these people who like Abraham, believe. So they prove that they are Abraham's children by walking in the steps of the faith of their grandfather. There's no other way. There's no other means. How, how was Abraham justified? Or how was Abraham accounted righteous? How did Abraham inherit the promises? By what? Obedience? No. It was his faith that led to his obedience. How do we know he had faith? Because he obeyed. How do you know you have faith? Because you obeyed. The command. What's the command? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, I've met many individuals who have asked me through the years of my ministry, how do I know I believe? How do I know? I mean, what's the indicator? Why did, and I realize and I recognize it. So what do we start doing? Well, did you pray this prayer? Well, did you ever walk down an aisle? Did you ever have somebody counsel you and deal with you of how you can be saved? And, and folks, the reality is those perhaps could be tools used to do that. But the bottom line is they are not the means by which we become justified. And they're certainly not necessarily the means by which we believe. I could ask this question. How many of you believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States of America? Every single one of you, whether you want to or not, would raise your hand and say, yep, I believe it. 
Now, now, how do we know? I mean, none of us were there, right? I mean, take the oldest person here. <laughs> they weren't even close to being there, right? It, it was what? It's all by a historical data points that we have. Right? And so we can go back into the history of our nation and, and go back and back and back and back and say, okay, well, here's, here's absolute proof that George Washington was the first president of the United States. And what do we say? Well, then we believe it. And we have something far greater than an American history book. We have the very word of God that tells us that it is by faith, by belief in, you and I would say, Jesus Christ, that we have eternal life. How is Abraham saved? By faith. No different than you or I. And so, verse number 8, the scripture perceived that God would justify the heathen through Faith preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So therefore, how can one get in on the blessing? By being born of, if you will, Abraham's faith. The blessing of being a child. Verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, men of all nations, even the heathen, were to be partakers of the blessings bestowed on Abraham. You really get in on the blessing? Even if you're not an Israelite? <coughs> even if you're not a Jew? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. <coughs> we know that. We understand that. We accept that. We believe that. Why? Because that's what God says. And so Paul, right into these believers, remember, he is, he is making a very important point that these Galatian believers need to get back to. And that is what justification is by faith. Look at Father Abraham. You, like Abraham, believe that you are spiritually his child. <coughs> Secondly, verse number 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. Why? For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. What is Paul saying here? <clears throat> Paul is stating, secondly, not only can we get in on the blessing by being children of God, but secondly, by this conflict. Notice the conflict that's going on. It's a conflict that is all over the place in Scripture. Isn't there a conflict between good and right? Or good and bad? Isn't there a conflict between um, a right and, and wrong? Isn't there a conflict between faith and law? That's his point. There is this conflict. And somehow, some way, you guys are confused because of the law. And there's this huge conflict. It is a masterful conflict. And by the way, Satan is the one who is behind it. Why? Because he knows what God has said. God has said it's by faith. And what does Satan do? Hey, hey, it's by law. Knowing full well that not a single one of us could fulfill the whole law. James would tell us what? To go astray in one point is to really go astray in all points. We could all say, you know what, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not a murderer. I've never murdered anyone. I never will murder anyone. Even, 
Even with Jesus' teaching on hating people. I, I, I don't hate a single thing. I, I remember being in a house with a, and a guy, he was, he was there, I was sharing the gospel with him, and he says, y'all pastor, man, I, I don't hate anything. I mean, even the, the gnats and the flies and the roaches, I, I won't even kill them. So afraid of killing something, and all of a sudden, that, and I'm like, I'll kill it for you if you want. I have no problem, especially if I see him coming around me, right? And, and, and you know why? Because we, we think that, hey, as long as I've I, I, I got to do something in order for God to accept me. And so Paul says this is God. The purpose of the law was to give to sin the character of transgression and proof that man is helpless to save himself. The law was not given to save man. You could not be saved by the keeping of the law. And so Paul says, again in verse number uh, 11, uh, Paul says, uh, but he, well, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. How is it evident? Because we know the statement that's given to us back in Habakkuk chapter 2. That the just shall live by faith. And there is a, a stipulation here, if you will. There is a, an incredible dynamic going on in that statement. The just shall live by by faith. What is that dynamic? The dynamic is simply this. Those who are justified were justified by faith. And those who come by faith are justified. There's no other way. So Paul is making this clear. Verse number 12, he says, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Simply meaning this. There's no possible way that you can fulfill it. That you can meet all its standards, all its requirements. But, it's still necessary. Let me just kind of point out, I, as a matter of fact, I just heard, I don't remember who it was, somebody just told me last week, now I know who it is, I won't call them out. Somebody was just telling me last week that a very popular preacher of our day said, you know what, the law is no good for us today. Throw out the Old Testament. Can I ask you a question? Does God throw out the law? Now, we might say, okay, you know, the ceremonial law, you know, the Levitical priesthood, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, we're not going to bring in sacrifices right here and, and have a bull sitting right here in front of us and, and uh, you know, slay that bull or any other animal and, and offer these sacrifices unto God, right? We're, we're not going to do that. Why? Because Jesus Christ came not to do away with the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. And that bull, or that goat, or that ram, or that grain offering, whatever it might be, was simply what we are called a shadow of what is to come. The real thing is who? Jesus Christ. So Paul says in verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why? Because he was made a curse for us. You see, the law just simply pointed out how bad we really are. And there was not a single sin in the life of Jesus Christ. The righteous one became unrighteous for us. The holy one took on unholiness for us. Paul is saying, listen, as soon as you make the law the means by which you are saved 
or justified is the moment that you state that Jesus Christ's death on the cross for your sins was insufficient. Paul is not going to come back and say, now listen, so let's do away with the law. No, the law is still important. The law is still significant to us. I've already said this before. I mean, is there any single person here that would think, you know what, it's okay now. It's okay to start murdering people. It's fine. It's, I, I don't care if, if a guy commits adultery with my wife. It's not a problem. Fine, go ahead. I've had her long enough. It's fine for someone else. Right? I would never say that. Well, I'm sorry to get so crude and crass with you, but just to make that point, we, we understand that. We realize that. What? The law is still important. It's still intact. God wants us to what? Abide by laws. We have to. The point is what? The law just won't justify you. Only Christ can. And so Paul speaks of this conflict. Law and faith. Well, how, how do we crush this conflict? Jesus Christ. He is the one. He is the means. He is the only way. And so we are, as believers, redeemed from the curse by our glorious head, Jesus Christ, as our substitute. Look at what Paul says in verse number 14. That the blessing of Abraham, <laughs> oh, I want to get out of this blessing. What is the blessing of Abraham? Might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And there's so much in there where Paul is saying, listen now, Galatian believers, listen, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you because of Jesus Christ. You don't have the Holy Spirit in you because of the law. You got in on this blessing of Abraham by believing on Jesus Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. Now, we're sitting here and we're saying, yeah, Pastor, we're a bunch of Christians. We believe in Jesus Christ. We're not believing in the law. We've never trusted the law to save us. And, and, and how is this going to help us? Verse 15. Through it. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. There's a blessing of Abraham, first of all, it's being children of. Secondly, it's understanding that Christ conquers the conflict. But notice, thirdly, <coughs> the covenant that we have entered. You see, what is a covenant? A covenant, we, we sometimes liken it to a contract. That would be a, a, a human perspective. Right? If, if you and I were to enter into covenant with each other, let's say that you're a builder and I'm a, I, I just bought a piece of land and I say, hey, listen, we're going to enter into a covenant together. And this agreement is going to be that you're going to build me this house for this amount of money. And what do we do? We, we signed a contract. But a covenant that is with God is different. God is not making any bargains. God is not doing any bribing. God is not doing any buying. God has simply said to Abram, Abram, you don't even know who I am. But I'm coming after you. I want a relationship with you. And when I enter into this relationship with you, here's the point, it will never be a null. You say, Pastor, do you believe in eternal security? Yes, here's one reason why. There's nothing about the covenant that we have with God or that Abram entered with God that could ever be lost. Understand the 
covenant. The idea of this covenant is the idea of binding of two parties. It is an Assyrian term, and so therefore, Abram would have understood this before the Hebrew language. He would have understood that, hey, there, okay, God, you're, you're binding the two of us together. And then he would ratify those covenants or that covenant by later on forcing or calling Abraham, commanding Abraham to what? Be circumcised. That was a picture. How important that is. And so this becomes what? Important to these believers. Why? Because what do they say? Hey, in order for you Gentiles to be saved or be justified, is you've got to get circumcised. And Paul says, oh, no. That's not the point of circumcision. Circumcision is not the means by which Abraham was entered into covenant relationship with God. It was a sign or the symbol that he was. And so Paul writes in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds. He doesn't use the plural there, to seeds, or as of many. But as a one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. There's a wonderful theme throughout Scripture. We started again in Genesis 3.15. That God says to Satan, or to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and thy seed, and between the woman and her seed. Who was that seed? We begin with Shem. And go all the way through, hitting Abram, eventually, Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying. Christ is the seed. Now listen, when you are in covenant relationship with Christ, the seed, you are in on the blessing of Abraham. This covenant can never be taken away. This covenant can never be annulled. Verse 17, In this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, Paul says, how, how, how could the law make you in covenant relationship with God if the law, if God said, Abram, you're in covenant relationship with me, and the law doesn't come until 430 years later. You can't have it both ways. The law was your teacher. It cannot disannul that covenant. That it should make the promise of none effect. So what is he talking about? That the promises through this covenant were made to Abraham and his seed. One of the things I love about the covenant that God makes with Abraham. There are three aspects to that covenant. As a matter of fact, God repeats it. Genesis 12, then Genesis 15, then Genesis 17. God wants to make sure, hey, Abraham, I want you to understand what this covenant is. The three parts of that covenant. Yes, we all think of it as property. You know, you, you take the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, you go along the Mediterranean Sea, you go north, and you cut across by the Jordan River. As a matter of fact, what God said to Abraham is way beyond the Jordan River. If you come all the way down into the south and, and come near Egypt or come near uh, Africa there, and, and that's the property, that's the land that God promised to Abraham. And, and there's truth in that, yes, but that's only a portion of it. It's not only property, but there's also posterity. The seed is going to be passed on, but it's also prosperity. God says, and I will be with you, the presence of God. With him. So this covenant that we have with God can never be disannulled or taken away. And so verse 18, Paul says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more the promise. Why? Because there's no possible way you can keep all the law. 
God gave it to Abraham by promise. You see, in this section here, we are really getting a fresh insight into the faithfulness of God. Into the certainty that what he has promised, he will perform. Paul is not just saying, hey, listen, guys, I, I want you to understand something. It's simply only by faith in Christ. It's not has anything to do with the law. That's not what he's saying. And, and oftentimes that's how people want to read Galatians. And Paul says, no, 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 no. All of these things are important. I want to teach you who Christ is and why Christ came. He came and he offered himself as a sacrifice to substitute for your sin. Last week, last Sunday night, we were looking at our study in what in the world? The Savior of the world we looked at. This is the Savior who became the substitute the sacrifice for our sin. It is only through Him that salvation is truly offered. You can't go to the world out there and say, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, if you become a Baptist, but everything's going to be all right. You come to Bethel, and man, I mean, you will, you're going to have front row seats in heaven. <laughs> right? I mean, I, we're going to be up there close, all right? Right? But no, of course not. It's what? It's all through Jesus Christ. He is the only means. And Paul is making this so clear. And Paul is saying, remember what he's already said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from this. He says, how could you have been bewitched? Who, who's the one who is doing this? I want you to understand something. It's all about Christ. And just like Abraham, because he believed what God said, he what? He obeyed what God said. And what he says to you and me is if you believe, then you will obey. <laughs> You'll behave in a way that honors and pleases and glorifies me. As we close this morning, Paul is taking a, a deep truth and he's saying, listen, I want you to understand the application. How this truly impacts our life. But in fact, he's going to get into it as he continues through the letter. Right. We're, we're, we're getting the, the, the depth of why Paul is stating what he's stating because it's going to come out later on of how this impacts our life today. If we are Christians, then our lives are to be centered around this gospel. And people ought to see it. They ought to know it. And so we can, as we study this portion this morning, can rest assured that our God knows what he is doing. Abram, I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldees. Why? What in the world? Well, you don't like Ur? I mean, you don't like the Chaldeans? No, I'm doing something. That is absolutely profound. We also understand that just like it is in salvation, there is nothing that can take away this covenant with Abraham. Not like our salvation. <laughs> there, there, there's nothing that can take away. Once I have entered into covenant relationship through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, his resurrection from the grave, the only way that I can be saved, the only way that I can be justified, the only way that I can be made righteous with God, nothing can now take that away. It's settled. It is a 
contra or a covenant that can never be disciplined. So therefore we learn that obedient faith should always follow the Lord's promise. What God has promised, I through my obedient faith, declare what he has promised. You know what? We have a world that's watching us, do we not? We have people out there who are looking at us, and they may scratch their heads, and they may say, man, you guys are weird. I wonder why they are. Why would they believe the way they believe? Why do they live the way they live? Why do they do what they do? Why? Because I know what God has said. My life, I want it to be a reflection of marvelous grace in my life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. God, we're so grateful and thankful that Paul would go through great lengths in dealing with how the Old Testament truths really apply even to New Testament believers. God, he's writing to a church or to a group of churches like us. Father, he is taking these Old Testament truths and saying, you know what? They're applicable for you. Father, we look at the illustration of Abraham. God, we know that Abraham was not counted righteous because of his obedience. God, he was counted righteous because of his faith. God, what a marvelous, wonderful truth that is. Father, we're thankful that you provided the means of that faith through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ came to this world and came with a purpose to pay for the price of our sin, that which the law never could do. God, we're thankful that that covenant, God, that we have entered into can never be dismissed. Eternal covenant. God, I pray that knowing these truths would truly affect and impact our everyday life. God, thank you so much for these truths. Thank you for, for the privilege that we have of knowing it and being able to study it together. God, bless us, help us live in obedience to you. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I wonder if you're sitting here and you would say, Pastor, that was so clear to me, I understand I've never truly been born again. I've never been saved. I've never had the righteousness of God imparted to me through Jesus Christ. But I realize that. I understand that. And Pastor, would you pray for me? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around this morning. If you're like that, just quietly slip your hand up and say, Pastor, please pray for me. I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. Never trust in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. You can do so today. Christians, can I ask you, how does this impact your life? What does this say to you? Father, again, we thank you.